Hello everybody and welcome to what is probably going to be a one-off on how to play Stellaris. Now, I've decided to do this because in about a week I'm going to be taking part in a uh, massive online game. Well, supposedly massive, potentially up to like 20 or 30 people. Um, maybe a lot less will actually show up but never mind if that is the case um, now some people there have said how uh, they're not that familiar with Dolores itself so for them and for anyone else who happens to want to watch I figured I'd make a, uh, a probably short but most likely going to be end up quite long video on the basics of how to play and followed up most likely by a time lapse of my inevitable demise because that is what happens whenever I play Solaris I end up getting killed um, I've got most of the packs involved uh, installed at the moment I think there's the Megacorp one that's coming out very shortly if not out already that I do not have um, this is the apocalypse background here uh, and that is a planet killer over there in the corner it's just blown up a world which is a fun thing to do. Anyway. New. Uh, so, you can see down here. Um, you always get uh, a bunch of races to start off with. These are all pre-generated races. So, Kelazan, Iterix, Morwir, Xanid. You get two humans down here. Uh, yeah, there we are. United Nations Birth, Commonwealth of Man. Tebrid. Earth custodian ship, so you get more added in the more packs you have. Like uh, synthetic dawn gives you uh, the autonomous service grid and rogue defense system. Uh, these guys, I think, are oh no, actually no, it's just asked about that. I was going to say these guys are probably like the plant guys, uh, but not not these guys down here are plant people. Um, so you know, if you've got the plant pack, you can have those get added on. I've already created a race up here. The Republic of Japan, a moral democracy. Um, but I'm going to create a new so you can see what it actually involved. So I create a new empire and go. So you've got your standard um, stuff down the left here, all the various categories. You don't need to click through those, just going next, next, next will get you through them. Um, you obviously start off with what you want your species to look like first. Human, machine, um, generic mammal, reptile, avian, arthropod, molluscoid, fungoid, and plantoid. Um, so I am going to go with uh, this chap. And these are um, the Happy friends. Actually, happy friend, because then I can have plural of happy friends. Happy friends, an adjective. Happy friend. And you can fill in this if you want. Blurg, or whatever. Uh, just like the uh, species ID, you've got quite a lot of options for names. So these are your auto-generated names for your leaders, your ships, your planets, and your fleets. Um, whenever, yeah, I know, I've got a box of it. Uh, whenever you actually make a, uh, or rather, land on a planet, however, it generally just comes up with the star name and then prime, or secundus, or tertius, or whatever, you know, one, two, three. It's only when you press randomize that it actually generates the planet names for you. Um, now, as a plantoid, I could select plantoid down here. I could, go, uh, I could have, um, yeah, one of those names. The uh, uh, the Sparkate Mar, the Luciulus. Um, fleet names, Na Broyo, Na Ferna, Na Vivia. Um, or the Flourishing Bouquet, the Vanquishing Bouquet. I think, uh, it's, yeah, I could go with that. Or I could go... Um, SPQR and yeah you can muck it up as much as you like so I'm going to SPQR um, traits oh yeah sorry probably should put in there 
ship prefix you can change that if you want uh, these are the happy friend ships so it's updates on here happy friendship Vixarius, ballista and so on uh, traits these are bonuses so every pop has a base output um, his base output is whatever is on the tile plus whatever the uh, building you put on the tile is um, the output can increase with happiness now you can have things on here like you know agrarian 15% food um, so if you are um, you, know, you want to make sure you've got enough food to produce populations that one's very good uh, energy credits mineral so intelligence so you get uh, science output increase a uh, focused science output increase uh, and then there's like adaptive so you can land on more planets uh, faster breeding better leader cap more experience gain um, so you can see there's a lot of bonuses here but you've got ones in red as well which are negatives because over here I've got two trade points and five picks that I can take I do not have to take them I can if I want to have a customized race um, and if we zip up the list to I think where is where, yeah extremely adaptive there that costs four trade points so you can see I've got two. If you want to be adaptive, I'm now on minus two. So I've now got to take at least two traits that have got minus one in order to counteract the extremely adaptive. Three, if I then want to take my final trait point, well, my final pick pick of a one thing. Probably going to start. Um, now there's like venerable as well. Venerable, you get plus 80 year lifespan. Now that means your leaders are probably not going to die generally through your playthrough because um, you've got a range of I think it's like 60 60 to 80 generally um, so you've got probably up to like 160 years that your your species your, your leaders will live for which means they're gonna get very experienced um, now I can't take non-adaptive because that's like the only one that's minus two I think. Um, wasteful, decadent happiness without an own population. Uh, mm, I really hate taking repugnant because it means everyone's just going to be hateful towards me. <laughs> they're just going to, they're just going to really not like me at all. Uh, deviants, yeah, let's take deviants. Deviants are a pretty safe one to go with. Uh, Solitary. Ah, sedentary. That's another one I generally go with. It's a fairly safe one. Migration speed means um, if you want to move a population from one planet to another, it takes a certain amount of time for them to relocate and costs you a certain amount of energy credits. Um, sedentary means why people don't really want to move, so it costs me more and takes longer to move them around. But I'm probably not going to worry about that on most playthroughs because I'll just colonize a planet and then leave them about. So I'll probably take sedentary. Um, weak you might think is okay because you know army damage minus 20% you're not really going to go and fight anybody fine does give you minus 5% minerals which uh, can be a little bit irritating. Um, oh yes try, try not to take quarrelsome unless you absolutely have to because unity output is very very useful um leader experience gain yeah i'll take that and go and charismatic which ruler impact 25 and other species happy, uh, own happiness plus five so opinion impact is for npc species um uh, if you're playing a single player game everyone's gonna be an npc um your depending upon what you set as your um initial engagement rules you'll have like a plus or a minus to um, opinion and you know the government ethics as well will give you a, a plus or minus to that depending upon what their ones are this is just a flat you get plus 25 so you can go up against a species that generally wouldn't like you but because you're charismatic they overlook that and they can be your friends and since I'm the happy friends that's what I'm gonna go with 
Um, home world name, you can put a name in yourself or you can randomly generate it. Um, Belmacosa Primer, seems fine to me. Um, I'm going to go with a, oh yeah. Um, you can change your starting system down here. Um, you've got various different things you can choose. Trinary system, binary system, start off actually on Earth. Um, on the Deneb system, which is the other human starting colony. Or random. Um, I'm going to sit in Trinary 2. And uh, the world type just dictates uh, what you can generally land on. So it's, because it's a space game, you're going to be colonizing. And so you can say, like, I want an ocean world, continental, tropical, arctic, alpine, tundra, desert, arid, and savannah. Um, now, these are on a scale rather than a grid. So if you go with tundra world, um, I believe then you're going to have very very little chance of ever landing on a desert world and being happy um, continental worlds are fairly good in the middle because it gives you fairly decent you know you can go to ocean worlds and tropical worlds without trouble um, savannah worlds arctic worlds a little bit uh, arid and alpine will give you a lot and desert and tundra you'll probably not be able to colonize until you've got uh, specific tech that will uh, improve the climates land on um, so that's kind of how it works so that's your starting one that's one you generally have 80 percent uh, happiness maximum on and it goes like 70 60 50 40 30 kind of like I might, might be a little bit different but it's basically like that um, your uh, city like how you want your city to look this again is just a it's just an aesthetic it doesn't really have any impact on the game other than the picture that appears up here so you know you can change it around um, there's various different levels depending on how popular the city is uh, I'm going to go with uh, go with Avia, Cubanoid I'm going to go with Plantoid City because I'm plants so I'm going to go Plantoid City there you go uh, ah now government and ethics this is the interesting one the authority you can see across here is um, basically gives you pluses and minuses. So, democratic, hold an election every 10 years. You have mandates in order to fill, which I think give you unity output when you complete them. Oligarchic, 20 years. Um, I think you might still have uh, the mandates there I'm not sure I don't really play oligarchic dictatorial which basically means yes you've got one ruler and you won't need to worry about your rulers changing so you can set your traits um, and that's gonna be that until they're dead um, at which point a uh, an election is ruled and you get the choice between various different people Imperial similar only it's uh, a designated successor so you're you basically you'll have when your character that you create here which is basically your ruler when they die um another character will become the new ruler and they will have a designated successor so you'll always be able to see um what your next ruler's traits are going to be and they don't really change a lot it's, it's basically like plus five minerals or 25% faster build speed on ships and things like that so it's, it's kind of um, influencing stuff um, the ethics this determines generally how happy people are with you um, you've got three different levels so you've got gestalt consciousness in the center you've got standard in the middle and extreme on the outside that costs you Three points you can see down there cost three points to achieve. Those cost one, those cost two. Um, you cannot have a Gestalt consciousness, maybe Gestalt and militarist. Because Gestalt is is basically everything. <laughs> because as you can see, it gives you quite decent buffs. Um, so each one gives you buffs. The extreme ones give you better buffs. Sometimes give you debuffs in the opposite direction, but cost more. So for example here, militarist, 
Uh, war exhaustion gain minus 10%, so you stay up for longer. Fire rate plus 10% on your ships, so you get basically your DPS is up by 10% on your ships. Fanatic militarists doubles that. Um, on the other hand, pacifists. Population resource production plus 5%, so you're better at producing resources and you get more planets to look after before you have to start worrying about sectors. And again, double that for fanatic. Generally speaking, militarists don't get on well with pacifists. They are diametrically opposed on the grid, so there'll be something like minus 50 um, happiness you know, attraction modifier between two species. So if a pacifist meets a militarist, there's a fair chance the militarist is going to try and beat the snot out of the pacifist. Same goes with spiritualist and materialist, authoritarian and egalitarian, and xenophile and xenophobe. Um, now, as you can see, there are no real uh, negative modifiers to any of these, but the negative modifier comes, as I said, with the um, diametrically opposition. And again, you, if you're a militarist, then xenophile and materialist, you can still be them, it's just what's diametrically opposed you cannot be. So if I want to say materialist, I cannot be a materialist and spiritualist, it deselects it. But I can be a materialist and militarist. Um, and as I said earlier, you can't be that and something else because that takes over everything. But this does lead me on to the Gestalt Authority, which is a hive mind and machine intelligence. Uh, both of these are immortal. Uh, the hive mind gives you 25% bonus growth and resettlement cost minus 50%. So that would offset my uh, sedentary. So I could have that and go, okay, that's fine. That basically stops my uh, sedentary uh, trait room having an effect on me other than slightly increased cost um, and machine intelligence is you no real bonuses there but it does give you better civic picks um, again your leaders are immortal but potentially can break down but I'm not going to worry about being a stock consciousness I am going to go with I am friendly, I am a xenophile, and a pacifist, and a egalitarian. Um, so that means I can be, everyone's going to be happy, um, people aren't going to be angry with me, and I'm going to be able to just basically go, yeah, i got lots of resources coming in. Um, I could go materialist, but... Uh, you know, faction influence gain. I'm probably going to have factions breaking out, and that's going to be very useful for me. And consumer goods cost as well. It means I've, I've basically cost less my population. Um, democratic or oligarchic? Uh, I shall go with the basic democratic. And as you can see down here, if I switch over, you can see some of the civics over there are changing. In fact, all of them are changing depending on what you go. So, there are certain ones that are democratic, certain ones are oligarchic, certain ones are dictatorial. So, Beacon of Liberty, as it says in the requirements, must be democratic, must not be a xenophobe, and must be egalitarian. And that gives me plus 15% unity, which is absolutely amazing. Cannot overstate how useful unity is in this game. So, I'm going to take Beacon of Liberty. Um, it doesn't mean, however, that people are just going to flood over to my civilization and take up all spots on the planet. That is free haven down here, and in migration attraction plus 50%. Uh, other ones down here, functional architecture, some of these are going to generic. So functional architecture just means it's cheap to build stuff. Um, life seeded, and I think there's another one down here, I don't know if I get, yeah, post-apocalyptic. These are very special ones. So these ones basically say that life seeded, you start in a Gaia world. 25 and Gaia. Gaia are absolutely amazing worlds to live on. I think they give you bonuses to your production output and happiness. Um, Post-apocalyptic is a tomb world, which basically changes my habitability from being 
tropical platoon world. Um, and, you know, as it says down there, can't be mechanist, can't be agrarian ideal, can't be syncretic evolution, can't be life seeded. Um, very, very few people can land on Tomb Worlds. You really have to go down a lot of research to be able to land on Tomb World. Um, so, if I went on Tomb World and say I, I got wiped out on there, then there's a fair chance that unless the person who wants to take it over is a machine intelligence or a hive mind, so they've got that, or they've gone down a lot of habitability research, they cannot then land on that planet because it would be just too devastated to support life. Um, on the other hand, I think post-apocalyptic doesn't really give you an awful lot of resource. Um, but I'm going to go post-apocalyptic, so I'm picking Liberty post-apocalyptic. Uh, and my, due to the ethics attraction down here and my authority, my overall governing style is a moral democracy. Uh, so this government is a pacifistic form of democracy, firmly guided by moral principles and non-violence. Yeah, because we live basically in a, in a, a, a nuclear apocalypse, um, which is probably why we are giant Venus flytraps studded with sores. Advisor voice, this is what you're going to hear. Um, it automatically picks one for you, so egalitarian if I play that. You seem overworked. Have you considered joining a union? Uh, there's the standard one. Priority alert. This pre-recorded message is triggered in the event that your VR unit has suffered a critical degradation of its ethical constraints matrix. Uh, you can pick anything you want. I mean, you could go spiritualist if you want. I mean, it's, I've not got any spiritualist traits, but if I wanted to... Thinking machines are an affront to nature. These profane constructs must never be allowed to... Oh, wait. Yeah. Um, and there's other ones that are soldier, technocrat, diplomat are not based on your government. They are ones that you can just select generally. So if you want to do, just go diplomat. Nothing is impossible to those who would try. And I'm probably going to go with the diplomat. Um, empire name. You can select an empire name yourself or you can tell it to randomize based on your species appearance and traits and all that. So... The Happy Friend Interstellar Assembly, the Republic, Galactic Confederacy, the Happy Friend Council, the, the Happy Friend Harmonious Union. That sounds perfect for me. And flag time. Now, um, primary and secondary colours, these affect your starship colours. So the primary colours is your hull starship, and the secondary colour, I think, is, I think this is the way it goes anyway. Uh, is the uh, colour of the trails and any lights. Um, so I'm going to go with yellow there. And uh, I'm going to go with brown. Um, let's have that there. And let's have a look through on the various flags. You've got various different ones here. Blocky, uh, which are very, like I say, very blocky. Domination ones. Um, yeah, you know, various ones from here that you might recognise. That one's very similar to uh, the Star Trek Alternate Reality one. Uh, you've got, like, Zerg down here. Um, human, yeah, like, there's, uh, uh, I think that was Italy, I think. <laughs> they had something very similar to that. You have the eight-pointed Star of Chaos in the corner there. And uh, the the Imperium, well, that's t not technically an Imperium of Man. That is the um, uh, Prussian Republic, I think. Uh, you can have communists. You can actually have the United Federation of Planets if you want to. Or money. Communist star. Um, speaking of liberty, you can do whatever you want from here. Um, ornate ones. Paradox one, which is literally just the paradox skeleton. Uh, piracy ones, so if you want to be like Cthulhu man, you can be Cthulhu man. Pointy and finally round. Um, now there's not any that kind of, oh, I don't know, it's bad. Piracy one. Um, I was rather hoping there'd be like a nuclear explosion one. Uh, that one's quite good, because that one's uh, an inverted peace sign, so I can go with that one there. Fine. And I will choose 
Uh, again, various types of ships. This is what you'll see most of when you're flying around. These are the uh, construction ships. This is what your construction ship will look like. But you have generic forms for the rest of your ships that you can do. Um, I'm going to go with Mother Squad ships. Uh, Rule and name. I shall randomly generate. Tolerlatorius. Yep, that's fine. Um, green, green, green and yellow. Yep. And change the background of my... Yep, there we are. Can't change my hairstyle and my clothes. So I don't have hair and I don't have clothes. And I don't have male or female. I am just a flytrap. Um, I could change the Prime Minister uh, to being... Uh, what, can I, what can I have that as? Um, Lord Fungus. Ah, now let's pop back to traits. Because one of the traits... Uh, it said one of the traits down here is... Oh no, it's because it's stuck survivor on there. This trait is required. Um, so it's stuck survivor on there, so I just go back in case I want to edit any of the rest of that stuff. No, that is fine. Yeah, that's fine, 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 and fine. And there you go. That is the happy friend harmonious union created. Um, they do like tropical worlds, although they live on a barren post apocalyptic world. They fly around in molluscoid ships. Their um, background is blurg because I couldn't be bothered to write anything. Uh, they are survivors, extremely adaptive, which come, you know, because they're survivors. Um, however, they are deviants, so they don't stick to pacifism or egalitarianism. They can shift from population to population, so I have a lot of freedom. Um, Sedentary, they really don't like going anywhere, and they're not that good at learning. Um, however, people do like them. They really do like those giant mutant saw pustule Venus flytrap beasts. Happy friend Harmonious Union has been saved, and after that, you're ready to get into a game. Um, so you bring up with this. The uh, how to start your game thing. Do you, uh, you know you can have tiny systems, small, medium, large, huge. I always go huge. Galaxy type, elliptical spirals, ring. Um, elliptical is our uh, is not our sorry. Uh, elliptical is basically just kind of a big splodge, I think. Spiral two arms, spiral four arms, or a ring. Ring is just literally a ring with a star in the middle, so you've only kind of got left or right. Those can be quite interesting um, because it does force you to deal with your immediate neighbours, either forming up unions with them, unions, you know, alliances, um, or trying to take them out so you can go on to the next one. You cannot really bypass your neighbours. Uh, in the other ones, you can generally make your way around. So Ring is very interesting for forcing you into complications. Um, AI Empires... Um, I've got the, these here randomizer slots, so if, normally if I turn that off, it says there's going to be 30. Turn it on, there's 15 to 30. Uh, zero. I, I don't think the game will actually play if I do this. Because it's like, how many species are in the galaxy? None! Um, in a multiplayer game, it probably will let you, but in a single player, it most likely won't. Um, so I'm going to say 7.15, which is in the middle range of answer that starts off, because I really hate having neighbours that just really hate me and are technically superior to me at the start of the game. Fallen Empires, uh, they are interesting fellows, because Fallen Empires are areas of space that are controlled by super advanced um, species, but they don't venture beyond their borders unless a certain event is triggered. They will just sit there and occasionally send you um, ultimatums to say, give us money or population or do what we say or we'll come and beat your face in. Um, and generally they will do that. Broader Empires 1 to 3, again, they're basically pirates. You can hire out to go and raid people. Uh, tech cost, tradition cost, yeah, fine. Primitive civilizations. You can either have none or like 
five times the amount. So if you want a really densely populated galaxy, you can have five times the primitive civilizations. Which means you're going to have like Stone Age, um, and Industrial Age, and Medieval Age, and you know, little planets scattered everywhere. Um, crisis Strength. I like Crisis Strength being at one because Crisis is always kick my ass. Mid game 2400 and end game 3000. Um, that's when those events will kick off roughly. Difficulty again, difficulty, yes, it's, you know, whatever, Captain, Commodore, Admiral, Grand Admiral. So easy, not as easy, medium, hard, you're going to get kicked to your ass. Um, scaling difficulty. We well, enabled any AI bonuses from difficulty setting at scale up over time. I leave that off. AI aggressiveness is low because I like not getting beaten up. Empire placement is random. You can have clusters, which means that everyone will basically be clustered together in various spots around the galaxy, forcing you again to deal with your neighbours very quickly. Um, advanced neighbours is off. Hyperlane density. You can have very few hyperlanes, which force you really to look off your um, you know, fortify choke points. Um, or you can have full, which is basically there's no point trying to fortify everywhere because there's going to be so many ways around. Um, I stick it on one. Abandoned gateways, let's have that on one. Uh, again, they're basically way around. Wormhole pairs, again, that's way around. Iron Man mode on or off. On gives you achievements, off doesn't, and you know, standard Iron Man mode stuff. So, hit the play button. Okay, so here we are in the starting screen. Um, this is basically what everyone will see when they start up. You've got your empire selected here, along with a bit of blur about them. Um, so this is here for the ones I've created, the Happy Friend Harmonious Union. In the Aeon since the first primitive Happy Friend communities took shape in the dense jungles of Belmacosa Prima, our civilization has spread and prospered. But Happy Friend society was not always united towards a common goal. In centuries past, mounting tensions between competing nations came to an apocalyptic head. A global thermonuclear war claimed the lives of billions and forever marred the surface of Balmacosa Prima. In the decades to follow, surviving friends faced radiological contamination, mutations, famine, and violent tribalism. It was in this grim crucible that the Happy Friend Harmonious Union was truly forged, and with it, a new world order. Now, after the discovery of the Hyperlane Network, the finest minds of the Happy Friend Harmonious Union have finished developing their first hyperdrives. The stars themselves are finally within our grasp. And begin. Uh, so, like a lot of Paradox games, you've got a little timer up top here. So that is your speed. Um, start, stop, speed up. You've got uh, fast, fastest, uh, slow, slowest. So depending on how you like to play. Just back to there. Um, this is the system, or this is my system I'm starting with. You can start with any system because it is can be totally randomly generated. Um, and you've got science to do. That's what these alerts are up in the corner. You will get these popping up from time to time saying stuff needs to be looked at. Be it science, or you've unlocked a new tradition that you need to do, or um, there is combat going on, or there's an election happening. You'll get these alerts that will come up and you just click on them and it will take you to what you need to do. Um, so, here are my scientists, as you can tell, a lovely bunch of people. Um, and physics research, so you've got physics, society, and engineering. Um, physics research is, you know, like lasers, science, technology, well, not science, technology, it's all science, technology, um, like AI, and um, stuff like that. Society is literally, you know, biological stuff, um, and engineering is ships, star bases, rocketry, that kind of good stuff. Um, shields, I think, come under physics. So I can uh, use my uh, costs. Yeah, there, there, and there. Science costs is something I do need to very quickly discuss. Um, Mainly because there are two types of empires that min max gamers tend to go for on this the uh, tall empire and the wide empire. Tall empire has a very small amount of planets but is very technologically advanced. 
the wide empire has a sprawling empire but is not central advance because the technology cost here you see it says base 500 technology cost is based on that plus i believe the amount of worlds you own um i don't think it's the number of population i think populations is that uh unity i think more pop have the more unity required to go so if you've got a lot of planets it's going to take a lot of science to get these advances as opposed to having few planets which will make it uh the the cost a lot less prohibitive however flip side of that is the smaller empires you've got less room to build science labs so you're probably going to have less science coming in overall um i honestly don't know if it's enough to counteract it um i'm sure if you had a wide empire and you just spammed science worlds everywhere then you would be probably having more science than tall empire uh, but that's basically how that works so if i go for um physics lab physics lab's always a good one to go for i mean research speed yes good um i'm not expecting to encounter anybody anytime soon so i don't have to worry about upgrading my weaponry um five percent is, is is pretty good i suppose it's just just empire wide um so you can see here you've got uh mania cosutius has a 12 percent bonus um so combat bonus speed he's only got two and they've only got a two based on their levels um now they've got he's got spark of genius that gives him extra 10. that's in characters I can go into that later, so no need to worry about that. Uh, physics lab, as it is in here, it gives you uh, it's 1.5 energy credits per month, and it produces an extra science or an extra physics over the basic science lab. Um, I'll show you the basic science lab if I go off of here and go onto the world and go to surface and yes here we are is a basic science lab down here now that only produces one of each but you can see down here it's producing 2.14 because i've got population there working it and the base tile uh if i go here terrain details yeah base tile is already producing one physics um so the base tiles as you can see here they have their own things that they produce as uh, so long as you've got a population working them if the population happiness this yellow bar here goes over i think 60 or 65 percent then you start getting a bonus to what you produce the building attached to that produces on top of the tile bonus which is what ends up with the you know that total there so if we go here that would be one plus two from there um and the pop is giving me a little bonus as well i think um but um yeah i mean it's it's so it's four output there four output there um you can if you want to build something you go on to a unoccupied space or space doesn't a building click build on here and it gives you a list of what you can build I can build anything on any tile, but if a tile is producing something like that's producing two society, it's not worth putting a power plant on there because that will override society. So ideally what you want is if it's got society on there, so it's a science production uh, tile, you want to put a science production building on it. Um, blank ones are fine for anything, and so generally it's a good idea to stick whatever um unity building you get on your bank tile because as far as i'm aware your starting world will always have at least one blank tile on it um i think they are supposed to be set up so they're pretty good as an average starter um and the people on your world are not likely to rebel against you anyway so i mean it's a fairly safe stable thing to start you with um 
A lot of these other things here that I've got uh, scattered around, these are tile blockers. Um, now, tile blockers, as you see here, it basically stops you building anything. So there's a bomb crater, massive crater created by a destination of particularly devastating hydrogen bomb. Um, you have to spend the cost here, 200 energy and 120 days, in order to clear that before you can build anything on it. Um, so every, I think every planet has these, or every starting planet has about like five of these blocked off, but they can all be cleared straight off. You don't have to do research to clear them. Other planets you come to will have to have research done to clear it. Uh, anyway, back to science. So I'm going to get a physics lab down here. Uh, Faustus Nippius is going to get planet, get month the Unity plus two. Yes, let's go for that. And Tula Popeus. Um, mm, that would be a very nice one. I mean, that does pop up very early. It's quite expensive, but I'm not going to have ships that can use uh, strike craft quite some time. Um, you need to have cruisers. I mean, you can build strike craft hangars around your star bases, but in order to actually take them out and engage with them in um, in other people's environments, you're going to need a cruiser or a battleship in order to actually have hangar bays. The smaller corvettes and destroyers cannot actually carry fighters. So I'm going to go with... Um, yeah, engineering, why not? Yeah, it's a nice, uh, nice setup. So even though he's got a higher speed, it's going to cost him... It's going to take longer to get the physics tab than it is the um, uh, engineering facility. Um, now, just before I go off this screen... You'll see we've got these here. So Spark of Genius, Research B plus 10. New, uh, Explores New Worlds, New Worlds plus 15%, and Propulsion plus 15%. And you've got the little tags with the science that's been produced here. Um, and you've got them down here as well. So Voidcraft, New Voidcraft. If I selected a science that's. Uh, Icon tag is the same as the skill of uh, the, the scientist. Then that would add to you know he would get a plus fifteen percent research bonus to that item. Uh, basically, that's how science works. So, select things from a list. The list is constantly randomly generated. Um, once you've got certain things in the list, you can go into tier two, tier three, tier four. So. Physics lab, for example, I can get physics lab one. When I've researched physics lab one, I will randomly get physics lab two showing up in my list so I can start researching that, and then three and then four to get bonus output from uh, my sciences. There is probably, I think there's like one or two buildings you can get that give you plus science across the board, uh, but the ones you can research here mostly are just focused on one particular area of science. Now, I'll pop into Unity one here, because this is something that you need to become familiar with as well. You have Ascension perks, which are not available at this time. Um, as you can see, everything is grayed out here. These are massive bonuses you get after finishing one of the trees. So some of them you know, are quite range um, in what they can do and some are mutually exclusive. So Interstellar Dominion means that Starbase is 20% cheaper and the claim influence is 20% less. So uh, claiming is using influence up here. Um, if you go to go to war you need to put claims down on other people's systems in order to actually have that when the war ends. If you don't, then unless you've selected a very specific um, Cassius Belly, like ending the threat or just changing someone's uh, operating ethics, then you, know, you don't get anything out of it. 
Uh, ten true send the seed. Research speed plus ten percent. Just ten percent across the board. One vision monthly unity plus ten percent. Governing distraction plus two percent. So again, if you can get say like harmony, um, and then one vision, you're gonna have this to rocking in quite quickly. Um, and if I scroll down to some of the ones down here, like world shaper, terraforming cost minus twenty five percent, allows us to create Gaia worlds. Naval capacity plus eighty. Uh, damage to end game crisis factions plus 50%. Everyone's increase, um, opinion increased by 20%. These are very good. I mean, I think a lot of these you have to get you know, quite late on. It's like Voidborn here requires star fortresses, but allows you to actually build effectively artificial planets. Um, Galactic Wonders here requires mega engineering, requires an empty extension puck, requires three other. Ascension perks to be so close. You can't go straight to Galactic Wonders and go, oh, I've got ring worlds everywhere. You have to go through at least three of these trees, four actually, four of the trees, get three other Ascension perks, and then Galactic Wonders. And then only if you've got Mega Engineering, um, Engineering Technology. Uh, each one of these has their own uh, focus. Some of these do change depending upon the empire type you've got. So, uh, hive minds and uh, gestalt consciousnesses, they have like other ones instead of diplomacy, instead of harmony, um, and probably instead of supremacy and things like that. They've got different things down there. The results are still roughly the same. So, harmony, whatever harmony comes up as, whatever this. Uh, far right one goes you'll always have a, a paradise dome like structure you can build um, as it says up top here you need a hundred unity in order to adopt a new tradition the amount of unity required is based on uh, the I think it's based on the amount of population you have um, but yeah expansion expanding your system domination is um, focusing on vassals, prosperity is income, harmony is harmony, basically, it's, it's like um, make them happy. Supremacy is combat, diplomacy is diplomacy, discovery is uh, wonders, you know, space wonders, not actual construction. Now that all that's out of the way, I can zoom. No, let's not zoom out for the moment. So, Back to the system as a whole, that's your world. So this is where you start off, this is your planet. Um, you see a lot of various icons on the screen here. The icons in white with a you know, black icon inside them, they are buildings. So that is a science lab there, that is a mining station, that's another mining station down there. This is my star base. Inverted ones are ships, so these are military ships because they've got chevrons and star. That's a construction ship, that is a science ship. And science ships are your bread and butter for what you're going to want to be using. You, these are the only guys who can go to unknown sectors and explore them and find planets and resources to exploit. The construction ship normally follows them up in order to build an outpost in that sector so that you can then add it to your empire. And the military ships are basically military ships. They're there to fire around and blow stuff up. So, science ship here must have a scientist on it. My scientist is Procula Munius, and his bonus is he uh, he's going to live a long time. Which is great because he might actually get up to a decent level. Um, now, you can also see I've got various icons around here. So, minerals, energy, minerals, science, energy there. The ones in green are ones I am currently collecting because I've got mining stations or science stations or whatnot over them. The ones in white are not collected. And if I go onto my construction ship and right click on it, I can build a mining station there for 90 minerals and one energy monthly upkeep. And that will get me a three 
uh, yeah, three monthly income bonus on my minerals. So initially, you are going to look at taking a lot of hits to your early economy in order to build it up. It's going to be lots of stuff. You're going to build up, build up, build up, and then probably wipe out half your economy just building enough buildings to, uh, to get your income up and then repeat and repeat and repeat until probably around the mid game time when you've got a decent income for both you know probably like a few hundred coming in for each of them each month and you can just sit there and churn out ships and uh, and not worry too much about the day to day um, now before I go any further situation law this is going to be important to you as well because every time you encounter an alien species you're not going to know who or what they are so you're going to get an option that will pop up in the situation log um, you'll get an update it will say something like situation log updated and you'll get an option to click on in here um, which will say um, like Omicron threat or beta aliens or something or, or something along those lines click on that and it'll give you a little button down here to research now researching through the situation log will stop any science research you've got going on at that time but will then give you um, normally either information on the uh, the thing you've just encountered or may potentially lead to a uh, technology train so you can kind of go down a train of going uh, for example the um, uh, crystalline life forms, for example, you can find them here. If uh, if you don't know what they are, you can scan them, and you can go, "Hey, we found this thing. It's we've decided to classify it as a crystalline entity." Um, and you can then go, "Oh, that's cool," or you can go, "Hey, let's see what we can do to exploit this." And you, if you go down the exploit route, then you can go, "Okay, you can have a look at um, destroying them with our ships, or doing remote research on them in order to gain bonuses." So it's kind of got branching stuff like that. This, what I've got up at the moment, this is democracy. Um, we get mandates because people get elected on the back of the people and the people demanding they basically live up to their electoral promises. And that is your job as the player to do that. And it will give you bonuses to do. See here, reward 500 to reward between 50 and 1,000 unity if I build four research stations in 10 years. Um, now I've got Space War 1 research station here, so I'm going to hope there's research stations in one of these spots that I can then build in as well. Uh, the contacts list up top here, that's just anybody you've met. It'll come up down here, uh, their opinion of you, which is like plus and minus, red and green. Statuses, uh, that's like are they in a defensive pact? Are they at peace? Are they, are they a, a tributary of somebody else? Those sorts of things. Relative power to you in terms of military strength. It covers the uh, technology level you're at, the well, you know, relative technology level, relative fleet capacity, um, and one other thing that I cannot actually remember right now, which is a bit of a shame. Um, Federation just comes up with the name if they're in it, and war status if they are at war or not. Um, click on someone, you can go communicate down here, and yeah, it will get you a little list later on. And then you've got various other stuff down here. Plants and sectors just gives you a list of everything you own. Uh, policies and edicts, so this is again, this can be useful for you, especially map stars this early on. Because that gives you a bonus to anomaly discovery chance. Anomaly discovery chances are good things to have. Um, can't do that one yet because I don't have the influence for it. Um, yeah, this is kind of how you operate your empire. Again, you probably won't need to worry about going in here much. Depending on what empire you've selected and what your governing ethics are, some things will be locked away. So, purging for example... I cannot displace, I cannot purge, because I am not a xenophobe. Um, so I'm only allowed to keep people on my planets. Slavery, I'm not allowed to engage, engage in slavery because I'm not authoritarian or a xenophobe. 
initial border status open or close um you can set this as you want everybody can set that there's no limit on it um if you want say everyone who you come across to stay out of your land you can just go set that closed and so anyone who turns up meet your empire emit they're immediately kicked out of your land and not allowed in or you can have open and just go yeah you can free free roam as you want um the only issue with keeping it closed is that i think that has a negative impact on opinion first contact protocol peaceful or aggressive so when you meet someone you are either you know just let them be or you can or you like attack them straight off resettlement um yes or no you know that's for moving guys around you can either say no i'm not gonna let it happen or i can just force me move cops around um i think that's for the ai doing it rather than you orbital bombardment but this is for when you are engaged in warfare uh, because quite often planets will have fortifications on them and you'll need to break them down before landing your armies because if you don't your armies are going to get slaughtered um i've only got selective because i am peaceful and and in Cezaire does not have pacifist or fanatic pacifist so i'm not allowed to do indiscriminate bombardment on planets food stockpiling um it's basically yeah how much food you want to keep in your empire up here based on how much food is coming in when you hit your food storage capacity any bonus food that you're producing goes to pop growth um because there is a 10 i think it's a 10 year it might be five year um delay between making changes on here it, in my opinion it is best to go straight onto large because yeah, you know, all right you might want to if you want to stick with minimal for the first planet you've got then okay but i always forget this exists after a while and inevitably i'll get to a point where i'll go oh i'm running out of food and i've not really got the time to sort it out because everyone's starving so i always go there stick it on large um that way yes it's going to be a long time before i can get any bonus pop growth but i won't have to worry about it really and war philosophy these are the wars you're allowed to run unrestricted wars are if you are not pacifist you can just go around and smack anyone in the face as long as you've got a proper um cash his belly for it liberation wars only allowed to do that if someone is being oppressed you can go and unoppress them or defensive wars which are when people attack you so that's basically how that part looks there factions you can't see i have no factions on the right hand side of the screen that is political factions um you'll get political factions that will pop up here from time to time they'll have little orbs under the name which you can hover over to and it will tell you what makes them happy and what makes them angry if you keep all your political parties happy you will get bonus unity output claims i have no claims i cannot make claims because i'm pacifist strategic resources are special resources that you can mine basically like like um minerals only it's things like uh, living metal or uh bitherium crystals stuff like that gives you a empire-wide bonus species shows you a list of all species in your empire as at the moment i was only one happy friends leaders give you a list of all your leaders um you see here i've got one governor who's governing uh, this sector and i've got four scientists because you always need at least four one for each area of research and one at the very least in a science ship um oh push you go back on there uh whoops wrong button unwanted leaders you can recruit if you want to there's various recruitments up here um you can also recruit from other um other signs so if there's a science ship down here you've not got anyone there you can click where the portrait would be and it will take you to the recruitment screen um now this is the recruitment screen here generally you only have an option of three unless you've got the recent technology and again gives you traits for them so cost down by half cost down by half um combat this engagement 
chance plus 25%. That's quite a good one to have on an Admiral, to be honest with you. Um, it's better to have something that buffs your fleets, obviously, the one that just gets you a guy who's cheaper. Unfortunately here, he's older, so uh, yeah, he's, he's not going to be as good for as long. Um, characters can gain traits the longer they do a job. Um, like if you have a fleet sitting out in nowhere, the Nabral on it is going to learn to how to marshal resources, so it's going to have like um, upkeep cost minus 10% on his fleet. Um, if he's out doing a lot of combat, then he's going to learn combat related traits. Scientists are going to learn science related traits when they're out and about. It's kind of, it's pretty, pretty fluid. Um, Traditions is this page here that I showed you by clicking up on the Unity. Uh, expansion Planner, if you've got multiple worlds that you know of, you can go into here and select a world that you want to settle and select who you want to go and settle it. Um, you can do the same just by clicking on the world itself, because if you click on itself, you'll have, um, instead of these buttons up here, you'll have a colonize button. You can then click on and it will basically do the same stuff. Um, fleet manager and ship designer fleet manager, you don't really need to worry about the early game, I don't think. Uh, this is basically saying uh, what you want your fleets to be. So, generally, whenever you build a starship and there is not a fleet in orbit around that starbase, that, that ship will become a new fleet. Um, Go in here, each fleet has got a command usage of 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever you've researched. And uh, you can click on the, you know, add ship on the fleet net. I don't know why, that, I don't know why that doesn't come up automatically, but there you go. Um, so you can see down here, if I've got classes 1, then I can see that it is set to being 3 out of 3 Corvettes. As you can see here, it's in 3 out of 3. I can up that, I can say I want classes 1 to be 20 Corvettes. And then I can say, okay, right, that's fine. And whenever classes 1 here is out and about, I can tell them to reinforce, which is that button. And that will use up as many minerals as it takes to start producing. Uh, the various ships that are required from the home base of Classes 1 to then up, you know, get the fleet up to where it is supposed to be. Um, ship designer in here, I've only got two because I've literally started, but you do get other options down here. You always get an auto generated one. This is the way my ships look due to the colours I've chosen. Um, this is basically a interceptor with two small mass drivers and one small red laser on it and you can see they do different things so the mass driver does a little bit more damage um, but doesn't do as much damage to armor the laser does bonus damage to armor but not so good against shielding um, a lot of people will say it's good to have focus on your ships so just like you know, have all your swarm ships as just knocking down shields and bigger ships at the back focusing on taking out hull and just doing masses of damage um you can do that or you can just have everything as a generalized ship um later on you can get technology that allows you to bypass shields or bypass armor word of advice is if you do get those do not put on the same ship a weapon that bypasses shields and a weapon that bypasses armor because the weapon that bypasses armor does not bypass shields and so you're going to be having constantly chipping away at both armor and shields at the same time so not really getting the benefit of having you know the the bypass there if you're going to go something like that you know, go bypass shields because a lot of the bigger stuff will probably have heavy shields and heavier armor um and so you know better just go bypass that just slap straight on armor and then hold and not worry about enemy shielding of course 
it is worth double checking on what uh, what the opponent is actually wielding before designing your deep, if at all possible. Um, up the top here, you can click on that, click on where it says interceptor, and it gives you various different uh, hull types. So I've got an interceptor, I've got a missile boat. I can switch it to being missile boat if I want, and you can see the design has changed a little bit. Um, I can stick nuclear missiles on, and I mean that's a plus 100% shield penetration, so it's not bypass, but it does you know goes rex shields, uh, plus 25% hull damage, and um, I'll just put a red laser on because that does bonus damage to hull. So there we are. That is a now custom designed ship that I can save. I can randomize the name if I wanted to. Um, auto design takes control. <laughs> yeah, I can go, go auto upgrade. So. Um, it's not a fully functional ship, but um, see there. I mean, it's best to go new design if you're going to, because these are auto designed. So you know, new design Corvette. I want it to be missile boat, and then put stuff on if you want. Um, that's basically how you design stuff. This is probably a very kind of convoluted way around saying how stuff works. So I'll just go and start scanning systems and see how it progresses from there. System survey concluded. Now this is a pop-up you will get fairly early on. Um, the discovery of alien life. It's just a lore pop-up basically. Um, it states that you know, one of your ships has gone out and found something that looks like it's either alive or was alive on a nearby world and it's kind of in the build up to finding intelligent life. Um, and as it says down here, the uh, Pomponius Mela has made a startling find on Orem 3, this is this planet down here, which is a habitable world. See down there it says it's a tropical world. The planet is teeming with alien life. For the first time in history, we've encountered life forms that did not originate on Belmacosa Prima. This amazing discovery has silenced those who believed we were alone in the universe. Although none of the alien creatures found on Orem 3 is sapient, it's likely only a matter of time before we encounter things that are. Now it's given me a bonus to site research for 60. And if I zoom out to my galaxy map, this is the galaxy map by the way. Um, you see here it is a ring galaxy, there's no way to the centre here. Um, Right, might as well pause that. There we are. Uh, so you can see this is this is my territory, the Happy Harmonious Union. Territory is expanded by building um, star bases in sectors. Um, it's quite simple to do. If you get a construction ship, you can just right click on the sector and go build star base. Um, that has a tropical world. I can go on there. Ninety-five percent. Habitability for me means my people can be very happy there. Um, but it's not got science, which is what I want really science in space. Uh, now, these guys can pretty much go anywhere. Uh, you can, I think, you can like mold, you can chain up commands to them, sort of say survey there, then there, and uh, like you know, holding down shifty by the way while I'm doing this. There we are, survey those systems. And if anything come up with science, then that's going to be a bonus for me, because it's going to be where I'm going to expand to in order to get my mandate up. Anomalous readings registered. Now here's something interesting. Uh, this is the anomalies that come from time to time. Uh, there's no way to tell if a planet's got an anomaly on it beforehand. Your scientist basically has to turn up and scan a planet, and then there's a chance it'll come up with saying there's an anomaly on it. Um, you see here, so the atmospheric readings from Nedum 5 do not match simulated projections. It is a challenging task, uh, which means it's going to take a very, very long time to sort out. Um, but because I'm you know, level 1, it and I've got uh, Lord Fungus Tullia Leteus, gives a plus 33% to uh, science research, it's going to be a little bit less than the uh, 
estimated 300 days to research it. Um, it's always worth doing them. In the past, there was a percentage chance to fail. Um, I think now it's just this, and it's just like it's gonna it's gonna take longer. You're always gonna pass, but it's gonna take longer to do on high level stuff. Um, and it gets your experience, so always do it. Um, so yes, yeah, uh, current scientists find this anomaly challenging, so the anomaly will take 180 more days to research. If you have multiple ships, you can change the scientists who's going to go and research it to make it quicker if you are that way inclined. Knowledge is the key to the universe. Right, there we are. We have completed the research. Immense ragged planes of shadow drift across the Dead Empire's face. They are cast not by clouds, but by sheets of organic material drifting through the upper layers of the atmosphere, hinged or rather jointed to allow for a small degree of articulation. Science officer Procular Monolus is yet unwilling to say whether these things are flora or fauna, or what possible purpose, if any, your elaborate shadow casting might serve. So, because I have completed that, I get a Shadow Plane modifier to Nebula 5, which basically means when I mine it, I get plus 6 um, Society Research. And he's going to level! You don't always get his pop-ups, right? you get like one pop-up at the start, the first time it happens, and then it just ignores it pretty much for the rest of the time. Um, so he's now slightly faster and slightly better. Here we go. This is one of those um, special projects that can pop up from time to time. Um, observe and record a moon. Uh, yeah, moon, lunar impact, okay. Situation log has been updated. So this one is time. So I've got 1,072 days in which to actually get this done, otherwise the impact occurs and I miss my opportunity. So if I get you and say research that, he's gonna pop back and he's gonna have a look. Construction completed. And construction completed again. Good, that's over here. Fine. Can I build another? Yeah, I can build another Starbase. Good. The special project has concluded. We were successful in our attempt to record the collision between Antares 2 and its moon. The event was captured from several different angles and transmitted live throughout our space. Most importantly, our scientists under the leadership of Procula Monolus are able to record a large amount of valuable physics data that will truly benefit our research. Give me 60 um, physics research and plus 200 XP, which is very good because he's slow at gaining levels. And just resume, <laughs> resume system searching. And all my scientists construction are completed. And Starbase is done. So you can see here that my empire is expanding. This is very, very bad. What I've got here, I should not leave that lying around. Because if uh, if you've got an area like this in your empire, you're probably going to get pirates spawning there. Um, the way pirates spawn is the um, the more borders you have to an unclaimed region of space and by extension NPCs as well the higher chance there is of a pirate nest spawning in that location and sending waves of jets and you know corvettes and destroyers out to attack system nearby survey systems. concluded so try not to leave this if you can construction completed here we go Thank you. Tradition available. I've now got you to have a dream. There we are. Um, and yeah, there we are. So this is how the traditions work. So because I've got three, it's a base cost of 100. I've got three traditions. So that gives it um, plus 146. Research concluded. I've got one tradition category to plus 5%, and I own three systems, which adds another 3%. So the more system you get, the longer it takes to get bonuses. 
Right, and there you pretty much have it. Um, that is a crash course on how to get started in Stellaris. Research concluded. Thank you. Research has just been concluded. Um, I'll put those in. So, um, from humble beginnings, a great empire can spawn. There are, as I said, in this particular galaxy, somewhere between 7 and 15 other empires. Empires can split, they can form multiple empires of their own. Um, and that is my grand impact on the galaxy itself. There you go. Uh, I can inhabit most of these worlds, in fact. I can have it all the ones I've found so far because of my extreme habitability traits. Uh, but yeah, that's that's roughly how it runs. There are stuff you know I haven't covered, like Starship Combat. Um, if essentially Starship Combat is your fleet power, which is you know displayed down here, versus the opponent's fleet power, um, the one who's got the higher fleet power is probably going to come off better. But you might be able to flip the tables if you've got the right technology um, if you go into a system and you have these guys set to always attack then they will automatically seek out anybody in that system to attack who is aggressive and engage in combat or you can just have manually do it by right clicking um, yeah there's plenty of other stuff down here like various buttons and what dots that you can use to look at overlays and all this sort of stuff um, but that's more beyond the basics that I am doing right now. So there you have pretty much how to get started and what various things do. Um, it's simple finding out what stuff is, just hover over it and a tooltip pops up. So I hope this has been useful for you and um, enjoy Stellaris. <laughs>